Hey, this is David the Real Midwife, and this video is probably going to be the longest one I've made so far because it's going to be a debate review, and I'm going to be reviewing a debate that lasted for two hours. Uh, this was a debate between Severin Zealot, someone on Twitter who's, a, if you guys don't know him, he's basically a very fervent um, Oriental Orthodox apologist on Twitter. Every basically every time you write one off a site or anything like that he always jumps to that thread and does a refutation he's a uh he's pretty adamant on that so he will come to you come to your thread. he will refute you if you try to talk trash about oriental orthodox or anything of that sort he's basically a twitter apologist it's the best way to explain him i mean he's kind of a cool guy i'll honestly and he debated Joseph Sweden and also Enoch, um, the the fake Orthodox with their fake Orthodox channel with uh, only five hundred subscribers. Basically, the total amount of people that's in those sects. Um, this was kind of an interesting debate because I expected a lot of theology. I expected them to dive into theology. I didn't get any of that. We didn't get. The whole debate was about church history. The whole debate was about this person said that, that person said this, instead of diving into it and trying to understand what those persons meant, which to me ultimately is a waste of time. I feel like the debate was ultimately a big time waster. Both sides had good points. Both sides had points that made no sense. Both sides debated on things that, in my view, didn't really matter. Um, so we're going to be che uh, checking the debate out, we're going to be reviewing the debate, but I want to get to the juicy parts first, you know, um, who really won the debate, right? Let's, let's get that over it. Who won the debate? I think in terms of, you know, there wasn't much theology, but in terms of theology, I feel like Severin Zealot co would convince people a lot more if he focused on theology. I think on theology, he won purely because... Sweden and Enoch have no idea about the theology. They they know about the they know about the history. They know about who said what, but they don't really understand the theological significance of what those persons said. And in that regard, if they focus on theology, I think at one point they will uh, Severin Zealot will actually manage to make them admit that they have no idea what they're talking about. I think if he focused on that, he will have uh, done a good job. He didn't which was his mistake in the debate. In terms of church history and why one should accept Kalkadon, um, Sweden, to their credit, Sweden and Enoch did kind of a good job. It was kind of unfair because it was 2v1. Um, <laughs> if it was 1v1, I think it would have been a lot more fair, but it was a 2 versus 1, which is not fair at all in a debate. It's, it's not at all fair. But um, in terms of, you know, in terms of, why we should accept Calcadon, they did stand their ground well in terms of history, but that's basically all they do. All they do is look at who said what, uh, who said what in what council, what did this canon say, what did this person say. That's their expertise. Other than that, <laughs> nothing. And they even, it was very awkward, even at one point they diverted to their fake orthodox talking points, which was very awkward. I felt like Severin Zealot, like, he he was within his right to say, like, why are we even discussing this? Like, what's going on? They were talking about how the Armenians had uh, unleavened bread and the Coptics had leavened bread. And so, why are you in communion with these people? Or how, like, certain communions were uh, ecumenistic towards Eastern Orthodox. And Severin Zealot gave, a, I think, a good response. He said, it's a, it's a mystery. And we'll expand upon uh, why... Severin Zealot, even though he didn't really have much of an idea about church history and ecclesiology, ultimately was instinctively speaking kind of on the right track. This doesn't mean that, this doesn't mean ecumenism, but it doesn't matter. These people, if you disagree with them, you're an ecumenist. So what can you do? It doesn't really matter what you think. So let's dive into the debate. Let's dive into what happened. There's a few important points that happen in the debate. There's going to be a lot of pauses because most of them is going to be like a couple long takes. It's not. I'm not going to be um, recording like single minute, single minute, single minute instances of me talking. So I'm going to have a lot of pauses. I'm going to have a lot of uh, um, uh, 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 
It's inevitable, so get used to it. So, the first question that is asked in the debate, why do you not accept Kalkadon? And Severin Zealot points out his issues, which weren't really tackled. Number one, he says that the into natures is not enough. It's not the Kirillian formula. He says it does not prevent prosopic union. And he says that the Chalcedonian definition allows you to interpret there being two different beings, two subjects in Christ. Basically, what he's saying is that the, the Council of Chalcedon is either Nestorian, which in his view is Nestorian, or it doesn't do enough to prevent Nestorianism. That's his initial objection with the Council of Chalcedon. Now, uh, is Chalcedon Nestorian? No, if you read the Chalcedonian definition, actually it uses a lot of Korean terminology. We'll go into detail about said terminology. Um, but the first line of Chalcedon, the first line of Chalcedonian definition is that Christ is one and the same. So that's the first thing that the Chalcedonian definition says. So I'm kind of I'm kind of having a hard time trying to understand how the Council of Chalcedon allows Nestorianism when the first line of its, uh, def of its definition is a key Kirillian term, a key Kirillian argument that says that Christ is one and the same. Give me a, give me a break. There's going to be a lot of water breaks. <sighs> So that deals with that, but again, later on, we're going to be uh, we're going to be taking a look at these things in a lot more detail. So it's not going to be just me saying this and then moving on. We're going to, we're going to be looking at what Saint Kirill said um, in regards to these things. So the second the second key thing that I want to tackle is that it's about terminology, right? So what did St. Kirill mean by nature? Did St. Kirill use nature to mean hypostasis in the same way Theodore of Sirius and Nestorius did? This is kind of the argument that Severus the Zealot and Severus of Antioch makes. So for Severus of Antioch, nature equals hypostasis. And uh, for, for, for Severus Zealot, for Jacob, his name is Jacob, for Jacob, he thinks that nature equals hypostasis. And he thinks that St. Kirill meant that nature equaled hypostasis. Now, this is actually refuted by uh, Enoch. He actually read a line. Um, I forgot the source, but it's in the debate. So you can check it out if you want to. But he basically refutes that. He says that there's a distinction between hypostasis and nature for St. Kirill. But then Severin Zealot points out on the unity of Christ, and he, and actually he manages to annihilate uh, <laughs> uh, Sweden and Enoch, which was pretty impressive. He actually baits them into reading uh, the Miaphysite formula in on the unity of the Christ, and as a commentary says in the debate. They change the topic after reading that. <laughs> they, they they try to change the discussion after reading the one incarnate nature form. So let's get into that, right? What does what does mere physics mean? What does one incarnate nature of God the word mean? We need to kind of understand that and I will say fifty percent of the whole controversy will be solved from the EOS. And a lot of Eastern Orthodox kind of have a wrong understanding. And this is really the key thing in this is as I mentioned in the stream I did with Jay Dyer is the word concept fallacy. Both of us really stress on this because a lot of people fail there. There's a there's a huge misuse of the word concept fallacy. So for Saint Kirill, as Enoch proves, Saint Kirill does not take nature equals hypostasis. But then Severin Zealot thinks that it seems they do. Well, actually no. And and I think the best example of this for the Eastern Orthodox side for us to understand will be Saint John of Damascus. So St. John of Damascus actually refers to the body and the soul as natures. And actually St. Kirill does the same too. So St. John of Damascus, um, I dealt with this quote, someone asked me about this, but he says that the, that the body, soul, and nous are natures. And he says that these are what forms a human nature. So a human nature is formed by three natures. 
And so Christ possesses these three natures. And and a friend of mine was confused and he was like, what does it mean by this? What, what was St. John of Damascus trying to say, say here? And as a matter of fact, let me try to find that quote here so I can read it for you. This might um, take some time. Uh, okay, so this is... <clears throat> This is chapter 16 in the Fount of Knowledge. Uh, he says that St. John says that man essentially has three natures, body, soul, uh, uh, three natures, body, soul, and he forgot to write it, but I suppose he says nous, and one common nature that are for common human species. The common human nature, which is one, is based on the fact that every man is made up of body and soul, right? And so what's really happening here is that he's saying that the human nature is composed of uh, body and soul and nous. And so when he's speaking of the body, the body nature, for example, it's not the same thing as human nature, right? So there's, so there's the same word, but the concepts are different. And this is the key thing to outline here. And the reason why I'm saying this again is so you don't fall into the word concept fallacy. What we want to highlight here is that uh, St. Kirill does use the modern terminology we will use today in some cases, but in On the Unity of Christ, he used the Mia Physis formula. Now, this might surprise some people, and I keep surprising a lot of people when I say this, but you guys need to listen to this carefully. Mia Physis is not heretical. It's orthodox. You need to understand a lot of people think that Mia Physis is a heretical doctrine and that St. Kirill was wrong. I've heard a lot, I've heard two of uh, Joseph Sweden's most faithful followers take that this is a heretical doctrine. One of them said that St. Kirill is straight up wrong. He tries to debate Oriental Orthodox. Every time he tries to debate, he gets absolutely crushed. And the other one ended up being a pagan. <laughs> And, and both of them misunderstand the formula. So, Mia Physis is not wrong. When St. Kirill says that there's one incarnate nature of God, the Word, we need to understand what nature there means. And I even tackled there that in a, in a, in a group chat. Uh, Seren Zealot mistakenly thinks that Physis equals hypostasis in that case. Not really. In some ways, it is, but not in its entirety. So in some cases, yes, it is a synonym. It is a synonym in ant antique sense. That's what that's how Saint Kirill used physis. That is true. But in that specific instance, one incarnate nature of God, the Word, is basically one incarnate reality. So the whole debate that Nestorius and Saint Kirill had is about whether there is one incarnate reality or whether there is two realities in Christ. So for St. Kirill, there's one reality, right? And that reality is incarnate. Now that reality is incarnate. That's Jesus Christ. And there's one incarnate reality. For Nestorius, there's two realities. There's a human reality and there's a divine reality. And now, and how does this really affect the debate? Well, for Nestorius, <clears throat> if there are two realities... There needs to be two manifestations of reality and realities. And he later on changes that position because he got crushed by Saint Kirill. But for the stories, initially he thought, you know, if there's if there's two realities, there must be two manifestations. What is a manifestation of a reality? Prosopon. Prosopon means manifestation of reality. And, and prosopon is a product of physics in this context. Not in the modern context that we use today, but in the context of that time. So if you say that there are two physics in Christ, for St. Kirill, that will mean that there are two prosopons. There's two prosopa. There's two manifestations of reality. And if you say that there's two manifestations of realities, that means you believe in two sons. And Nestorius himself, credit, and there's a credit to Severin Zealot, Nestorius actually didn't really believe in the two sons theology. The force of St. Kirill's argument is that his arg is that Nestorianism leads to two sons theology, leads to two persons. Because when you say that there are two physics, two realities, that leads to two manifestations of those realities. So when Nestorius <coughs> believed in Diophysitism, and Severin Zild is actually correct, Nestorius did believe in 
two natures, one person, but his two natures and our two natures are not the same thing. His two natures and Chalcedonian two natures, they're not the same thing. They're two different things. So uh, when, he, when he says there's, there's a, that Christ is Diophysite, that will logically mean to prosopons. That is exactly why, by the way, St. Kirill speaks of those physis as theoretical. And guess what? Kalkedon does the same. And, and, and Joseph Sweden does not know about the topic, nor, nor does Enoch, because if they knew about this topic, they will point this out to Severn Zealot, but they didn't. As a matter of fact, I had to do this in the Twitter debate we did, I think, I think a month ago or so. So they don't know about the Chalcedonian definition, yet they're trying to argue about it. This is why it's a waste of time. You need to do the research and then you try to debate about it. Don't debate about things that you don't know much about. <clears throat> so this is why St. Kirill says <clears throat> in his second letter to um, Sokensus, yep, he says, to the manner of the incarnation of the only begotten, theoretically speaking, Insofar as it appears to the eyes of the soul, we will admit that there are two united natures, but only one Christ and Son and Lord. Why is he seeing, saying only theoretically? Because as I mentioned before, there's two theoretical realities, but in reality, in the real world, there's only one reality. That's the whole argument he has with Nestorius. That is the whole argument. It's not just one person versus two persons. That is the key of the argument. That's why he used the Mia Physis formula, because the Mia Physis formula refutes Nestorianism completely. <clears throat> so you can say that there are two physis in Theoria. And again, later on in Orthodox thought, the physis we use now and the physis that was used then, two different things, two completely different things. But as I also noted, in a debate I had with Severn Zealot on Twitter. When you reject two realities, two physics in Theoria, you're rejecting them as natural properties. When you're rejecting them as natural properties, which is what St. Leo did, when you're rejecting them as natural properties, you're rejecting that there's properties according to the human nature and properties according to the divine nature that Christ has. When you're rejecting that, you're rejecting the human energy that Christ has and the divine energy that Christ has. This is why when you look at uh, Severus of Antioch, he says that in terms of energies, in terms of wills, we reject every single duality. He uses St. Dionysius the Areopagite in saying that there is a Tiandric energy. Now, he does believe in the Tiandric energy. To his credit, there is a Tiandric energy in Christ according to Severus of Antioch. But... He then says that we reject dualities in those wills and energies. So he rejects there being two wills and two energies. And John of Ephesus points out that Severus of Antioch was the father of uh, monotelite thought. That he was, whether intentionally or unintentionally, he was the father of mon monophysite thought. Now, uh, monotelite thought. Now, we're going to get into this more in detail. We're going to look into the research done by Joseph Farrell, who goes really in-depth. But let's move on, right? So we dealt with the Mia Physis. Uh, now you understand what Mia Physis means. But uh, another point that Mia Physis also emphasizes is that Christ is out of two natures, which this is, by the way, dogmatized in the Fifth Council, that Christ is of two natures. So this formula is also dogmatized in the fifth council. So we accept both in two natures and out of two natures. These are not mutually exclusive um, formulas. They both actually complement each other. You actually have to hold to both of them. Because if you reject out of two natures formula, you do end up being Nestorian. Uh, or at least you veer dangerously to Nestorianism. So there's a point there with Severus. But... If you reject into natures, you veer into mana energism, you veer into monotelitism. And you have to accept both of them. And Orthodox ultimately accepts both. We don't accept only into natures. We accept both formulas. Both formulas. And by the way, St. Kirill does the same. The proof of this is the formula of union with John of Antioch. And I know at other places he refutes in people that use the into natures formula. I completely understand because 
and this is proven by after the formula of union a lot of the people including Theodore Tosiris they accept what St. Kill says but then they don't accept it right so they say they um what's the best word for it <clears throat> so they will say things like that the natures are inseparable and such but then they will still make this story in argumentations right and that's because they don't accept out of that that's because they don't accept mere physics that's the issue and saint Cruz's point is that both make sense both are compatible right both make sense with accurate qualifications and calcutta uses those qualifications one interesting thing that happens in the debate, by the way, Sweden tries to tone police uh, Severin Zillet. He says, why are you calling me an historian? Why are you saying that we're an historian? Now, if you're not an historian, but you can't really tone police him for thinking that you're an historian because that's the position of the traditional OO position. So this is the weird thing, like, right? They will, they will argue against ecumenism, but then at the same time, they will uh, tone police him for not being ecumenical. Sweden, why are you a hypocrite? It's, he does the same thing with me too. Because I call him a fake orthodox, I'm an ecumenist. Even though, because I'm against ecumenism, I call you a fake orthodox. If I taught you as a legitimate orthodox, that will make me an ecumenist. <laughs> that's what, that's what the, these people don't get. So they, these people have no idea what they're talking about. They're very hypocritical. Anyways. Severin Zillet then goes on to argue. So a lot of the debate, too much of the debate is about Ibas and Theodore of Sirius. It's mostly about Ibas. Um, so he says that you, you exonerate Ibas. You say that he's orthodox. You, you say that you accept him. And because you accept him, that, that means that Kalkadon is an historian. And Sweden responds by saying that, well, he repented at Kalkadon, which he did, and his writings were condemned in the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And then Severin Zealot responds that, okay, he's right. you can't separate his person from his writings. This is kind of... I will say this is not really accurate. You can condemn someone's writings, but not condemn him as a person. And the best example will be Ibas. And another example will be Eftikis, which, are, which, weirdly enough, throughout the debate, um, the fake Orthodox did not even mention Eftikis. They only mentioned him after the debate in the comment section. That further proves on they have no idea about the about the debate. They only they looked at the debate uh, they had and they were like, okay, we didn't do enough. Uh, uh, let's find more things. And then they found Eftihis and uh, the second Ephesian council. Oh, Eftihis was exonerated. And they just made a lot of huge comments. Uh, okay, but why did you not mention them in the debate? Oh, because you have no idea about the whole controversy. That's why whenever I talk to Oriental Orthodox about what do you think about the debate? Did it convince you? They said, no, like... My our grievances about Kalkadon were not really answered. <laughs> Water break. So is Severin Zealot right in thinking that you can't separate separate Ibas for as a person from his writings? No, because again, Ibas repented from his beliefs. And when the writings were concerned, they were referring to the, the, the robber council of Ephesus, right? So they were exonerating him from that robber council and considering that council as an illegitimate council. That was the whole thing. That was the whole issue of exonerating him. Now, Ibas did have unorthodox writings. That's why his writings were condemned. But he claims that he repented for it. And even Severin Zealot himself says, Maybe he repented. He himself said, I think he repented. Okay. Then that's done. That's it. I mean, the same, you can use the same argument for Eftihis. Uh, Eftihis, now, first of all, Eftihis had no idea what he was talking about. He was an idiotic old man who was very confused. He will make heretical statements and then he will make orthodox statements and he will confuse them. 
and anyone that hears them hears them he's the kind of a guy who will start speaking and your iq points will start to drop he was that kind of a person and even the oriental orthodox communion even the oriental communion condemned him as a heretic because they realized oh this guy's an idiot this guy is not saying what we're trying to say this guy's is literally a monophysite and they condemned Eftichis. But, but the point is, we can use the same argument to you. We can say, well, you exonerated Eftichis in your robber council, in, in the second council of Ephesus. So if you're going to argue about how Ibas suddenly disproves orthodoxy, then on the same token, we should be using Eftichis as an argument to disprove oriental orthodoxy. So both of our, oh, so both our churches are incorrect by that logic makes no sense so it's it's double standards so seven zealot is using double standards and again because the fake orthodox are incompetent they didn't make use of that double standards it was really wide open i mean ft is kind of a well-known person he's a well-known character very influential character so i don't know why he they didn't use him anyways so Severin Zealot goes on to argue about Ibas, Ibas of Edessa, um, whose writings were condemned in the Fifth Ecumenical Council, uh, Second Council of Constantinople. So he says that Ibas was accepted as a person, exonerated as a person, but his writings were condemned. So for, for Severin Zealot, this is, for Jacob, for this is problematic. Um, he doesn't understand how a person can be cannot be condemned but his writings can be condemned for him that's that doesn't make any sense but it will make a lot of sense because again the the person of Id ibas and his ideas they're kind of there's kind of a distinction there so when we're dealing ibas repented at Chalcedon, but there obviously are existent writings of him and as as uh, as the uh as the fake orthodox later point out in the debate <clears throat> At the time, people weren't even sure if it was Ibas that wrote those. So there was doubt uh, in 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 the Chalcedonian party. Let's say it was there was a doubt in the Chalcedonian party whether those supposed writings of Ibas of Edessa were actually from him or from someone else or even forgeries that tries to make him look bad. Because we you know we're dealing with a person who was. Uh, nearly going to be killed to death. He was nearly going to be killed in the Council of Ephesus, the Second Council of Ephesus. So he had a lot of enemies. A lot of people had reasons to forge his writing. So it took a lot of time for us to, you know, understand. Oh, th he really wrote this, right? He really wrote this, and that's why his writings were condemned. But again, he. Um, For Jacob, this is a problem, you know, it's still a problem because Ibas uh, was part, like, he was the kind of, he says that the Ibas was kind of the Nestorian who will say that Mary is the Theotokos and all that, but he will still argue for Nestorianism. And he says that I'm not convinced that he really changed his mind, but ultimately his, Ultimately, you know, this debate, this point resides on the fact that he thinks that Chalcedon does not do a good enough job at dealing with Nestorianism. He doesn't think that it does a good enough job at dealing with Nestorian theology and so forth. And again, we're going to get, you know, we're going to look into Chalcedon, uh, what happened in the council, and see if that's really that really is the case or if it's really just a bunch of heretics making stuff up. Hold on, let me close this window. <clears throat> so, Sweden then goes on to rightfully press, and he says, how could Chalcedon not respond to Nestorianism when it told people to renounce Nestorian positions? Yeah, I mean, this again, this is kind of a correct response. It's, it's not really a convincing response, but it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a basic p thing to point out. He mentions the Fifth Council of Constantinople that condemned him later. But for for Jacob, this doesn't matter. Um, because, again, he can't fathom th the distinction between the writings of a person and the person himself being condemned. He can't fathom that sort of a distinction. Then the debate kind of temporarily shifts to the Second Council of Ephesus. Now, uh, there wasn't really much focus there, but... 
one thing uh, Sweden mentioned that you know the whole uh, reason why Kalka didn't even happen. He said that uh, it happened because the the second council of Ephesus killed Saint Flavian, and then we hear from Severin Zealot from Jacob that actually it didn't kill him. So he argues that there are certain scholars. Uh, I believe he cites Chadwick and Freud or Fred. Um, his pronunciation is a bit a bit uh, weird, but just like my pronunciation, of course. But he cites Chadwick and Freud in saying, no, they ac no actually Saint uh, Flavian died in 450, February 450, so months after the council. Now, this is a poor argument, and the reason why this is a poor argument is that that doesn't really deal uh, with. Uh, the second cause of Ephesus having part in killing him or not. It doesn't deal with the fact that what the council of Ephesus did did Saint Flavian get beaten by the people and did he get injured? Yes, after the council he got seriously injured. So it doesn't really change anything if he died three days later or months later. He still died because of the injuries. Um, unless he would like to argue that he was actually completely fine and he didn't suffer any injuries and him dying close to the date of the council is a complete coincidence. I mean, you can argue that, but to me, that seems like, you know, uh, that seems to be, there's too many things that uh, he's relying on a tight rope. It, to me, it doesn't convince me. Maybe it convinces him. Maybe it will convince OOs. It doesn't really convince me. I don't think it's a convincing argument. And coupled with the fact that the Oriental heterodox have a tradition of beating people up with the uh, people beating people up beating the people that disagree with up so theater of series uh, nearly got the same treatment um saint kill's family got this treatment saint kill's family after he died members of his family his nephew for example said that dioscorus tried to kill them that dioscorus hunted for them and tried to kill them that and that's why his his family escaped egypt they basically had to run away from dioscorus now i had this I mentioned this in our debate with uh, Severin Zealot, and he said that, oh, that's a Chalcedonian propaganda. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's a Chalcedonian propaganda because it's his family. And so you're kind of stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place because if you say it's a Chalcedonian propaganda, you're saying that St. Kirill's family is a bunch of liars, that they're a bunch of liars. Why would St. Kirill's family lie about being hunted? By Dioscorus, who supposedly... Uh, saint kirill's basically like spiritual heir and i'm not trying to get like a smart uh, attack on his theology i actually think dioscorus theologically speaking was pretty close to saint kirill um, not one-to-one -one, but he was pretty close to saint kirill in a lot of in a lot of different ways but um why will he do such a thing well again it's because certain disagreements right uh pretty much beating it is the same happened with the uh Assyrian Church of the East. Now, both sides don't actually know this, but at the time of St. Isaac the Syrian, um, we were actually pretty close to maintaining communion with uh, Assyrian Church of the East. That's why Isaac of St. Isaac the Syrian is a saint in our church, because at the time, his church and our church were in communion. So this is something both sides that don't really know, but um, what made them move towards more close to Nestorianism, partially is because of the Oriental Church putting pressure on them. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dive into too much history and like, oh, you did this, you're bad. Like, it's ultimately meaningless to me, but I think it's kind of relevant to the specific conversation, which is Ephesus two. Uh, so yeah, it that's pretty much deals with Ephesus two, the Robert Council, and then Enoch. Enoch joins in the chat, and this is after this uh, the debate turns from one v one to two v one. I think it comes at like minute twenty five or so, minute twenty, minute twenty five. And this is the part where I, as I explained before, this is the part where Enoch comes in, argues that Saint Kirill did not mean physis equal hypostasis. Then Severin Zealot uh, traps them. Uh, so very, I, I don't know if he did that willingly or if he unwillingly did this, but he basically traps Enoch 
into reading one incarnate nature formula and they didn't really seem to know the um, one incarnate nature of God, the word. I didn't really know how to respond to that, so they changed the topic. Um, let me see. Okay. So, some stuff, some debate about Chalcedon and Kyrillian formulas happened. And so, Severin Zealot's response, uh, when Sweden says that Chalcedon uses Kyrillian ideas, basically, Severin Zealot responds to it that Chalcedon uses, uses the into nature's formula. It does not use the Kyrillian formula. Now, this is very important because... Uh, I feel like, and we had a Twitter debate on this with Severin Zealot, and again, you can check it out. Um, the original thread that we did a debate on is gone, though, because the user uh, deactivated his account. So I don't know how you can actually find that. But we did have a three-hour-long debate on this in text. And my general response to that is that um, the formulas really don't matter. Right, it's the same thing with the word concept fa fallacy. I mean, it doesn't really matter what the formulas, what the formulas are. Obviously, Saint Kirill had the preference of out of two natures formula. He had a preference for Mia physis, Right, these were his preferences, but it doesn't mean that there is not an alternative way you can describe things. And I think that Chalcedon, and soon we are going to be looking into this. Um, if you look into the Chalcedonian definition. I'm repeating myself here, but we're going to be analyzing the Chalcedonian definition pretty much in depth. But if you look at the Chalcedonian definition, uh, the into nature's formula is not the into nature's formula in Chalcedon is not the same into nature's formula as the Antiochians used, right? It's not the same into nature's as Nestorius used. So it's a different formula, and there are various Kyrillian adverbs again that emphasize. Uh, the unity of Christ. So Saint Kier so formulaic thinking, the thing the weird thing here is the formulaic thinking is kind of a product of Nestorius, actually. It's not a it's not something that Saint Kirill is used to. Sure, he has again, he has formulas that he prefers because for him that's an easier way to explain himself. But that doesn't matter. He's he's as as his letters to Sokensis and as his letter to uh, John of Antioch shows he is fine with being flexible, but the problem is that the Oriental heterodox, they're not fine with being flexible. They can't fathom being flexible. And um, Kalkanon still uses Kyrillian thinking. Uh, so Severin Zealot claims Nestorius used into nature's one-person formula. And he then says Kalkanon doesn't clarify enough and distinguish itself from Nestorius. Again, we're going to cover this in depth. But... Um, Chalcedonian definition explicitly says that Christ is a single prosopon, so it's not really the same thing as Nestorius teaches. I mean, you, even you yourself admit that Nestorius eventually moved on to a understanding of prosopic union, but this is not what Chalcedon teaches. Um, his, the qualifications in the Chalcedonian definition they don't match up with the de, uh, with Nestorian version of theophysis. So. It's kind of weird that the that Sweden didn't really understand because really, you know, two sons theology is not Nestorianism really isn't two sons theology per se. Uh, it really is setting up two dual subjects, dual separate subjects in Christ. So he could again, as I mentioned at the at the start of this debate review, Nestorius will say, Yes, I believe in a single person. But Saint Kirill points out, okay, you might say that, but you're Theology leads to that. That's why he attacked Theodore of Mopsuestia and Theodore of Tarsus. Because really, the historicist theology goes to that direction. That's his argumentation. That's the root of his rejection of the Theotokos label. Right? So, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of, the debate kind of moves in a different direction. Uh, one interesting thing that Severin Zealot points out is that Theodore of Sirius avoids Theopaschism uh, in Erenistes. Now it's kind of funny that he mentions er Erenistes because 
What's really funny about him mentioning Arenistus is that Theodoret it uses Kirillian terminology and formulas. <laughs> So I don't know why he will mention Ernest. He's kind of shooting himself on the foot. I mean, sure, you, I'm going to get to the Theopaschism, but Theodoret used to be against uh, any sort of Karelian notions about the person of Christ. But in Ernest, he's actually strictly defending some sort of a hypostatic union. And uh, if not, if you don't think it's hypostatic union, he's defending... His, his argumentation is very close to St. Kirill's argumentation. He pretty much borrows terms and argumentations from St. Kirill, which is pretty ironic because he used to be one of the biggest enemies of St. Kirill, but now here he's using St. Kirill's argumentation. So eventually he comes to understand that, hey, you know, this guy is kind of right. This guy is actually correct, and maybe I was the one who's wrong here. So in terms of Theopaschism, I think that's kind of, it's, it's half true. Right, it's true that Theodoret uh, is not Theopas. It doesn't believe in Theopaschism in the same way Saint Kirill does. That is true, but his reasoning—you need to understand his reasoning because his reasoning is not a heretical reasoning. And perhaps, if you qualified further on, perhaps he will actually start to agree with Theopaschism because he does say that Jesus Christ is the one that suffered on the cross. He doesn't have any problem with admitting that it was Jesus that it was. Uh, Jesus Christ that suffered on the cross. He doesn't have any problem with admitting that Jesus Christ is God. The problem here is that for him, when you say that God suffered, he seems to think that God suffered in his own nature. And to him, this is blasphemous. For him, that's where it's wrong. So when St. Kirill says, and when St. Athanasius says God suffered, they're talking about hypostatic, right? They, they talk about he as a person suffered. Right, Jesus Christ is God. Uh, God, uh, Jesus Christ suffered. Jesus Christ is God. God suffered on the cross. That's their logic. Whereas for Theodoret, he seemed to understand it more as, right, uh, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ suffered, but God didn't suffer, because Christ did not suffer in his divinity. Christ suffered in his flesh, and that's the problem. So. Again, this is not. I'm not trying to defend and say that he's completely 100% orthodox. I don't. I I think he's wrong. I think Theodor is wrong, but he's very close to being correct. And I think there needs to be a lot more qualifications in his thinking. So ultimately, it's not him trying to avoid Theopaschism and thinking that's purely heretical. It's him. It's him not being able to understand that. Uh, he thinks that God equals divine nature, pretty much. That's kind of his understanding. That's why he rejects Theopaschism. But if you look at, you know, before, like, after he rejects Theopaschism, he he pretty much uh, lambasts Irenistis for not believing uh, <laughs> in the unity of Christ, <laughs> in, a, in a way. He, Irenistis, in the body and soul analogy, he's separating the body and the soul. And he's like, no, they're united. They're one. What are you talking about? What is what? You, and he's he's even saying that uh, he's they they're arguing about the sinfulness, right? So the body, they, this uh, Arianista says that the body is sinful, but the soul is not sinful, right? And that's why the soul is immortal and the and the body is uh, mortal. And then and then uh, Theodoret basically says this is absolutely absurd. Uh, no, that this is not how it works. We have a person that's. Uh, that's sinful. If you if you cha if you just make the body sinful and the soul not sinful, you have a completely heterodox understanding. So Theodoret again, at times he's completely correct, and at times he goes off completely wrong. So again, the, just saying uh, it, it's true that he doesn't believe in Theopaschism, but in a way he does. So like yes, he does, but at the same time he doesn't. But. Uh, I should stop saying but too often. But so um makes it pretty uncomfortable for people listening. Anyways, let's move on. The debate moves to scholarship. So they're debating about certain writings, who wrote what. And as I mentioned before, to me these are very boring debates, but Enoch is right to mention 
that he re- he straight up flat out rejects certain scholars completely, and he says, "I don't care what they say." And he's and his reasoning is that they're not Christian, right? We only care about what Orthodox fathers say. And to his credit, this is the attitude to have, right? We we should be rejecting Christ hating uh, so called scholars and only listen to what the church fathers say. And, Ultimately, I think this will be one of our arguments in defending uh, St. Dionysius the Areopagite's um, writings being authentic instead of there being some sort of a pseudo-Dionysius. There is no pseudo-Dionysius. We, St. Dionysius is one of the 70 apostles. And really, for us, it's enough for us to argue that, well, we think so because our fathers say that it is the same person, right? So we listen to what our church says rather than what secular scholars say. And also, there's also scholarly proof that uh, proves that Saint Dionysius was one of the seventy apostles. But essentially, uh, Severin Zealot does try to use certain scholars that are not Orthodox, that are not Christian. Uh, a lot of the scholars he use has a very Oriental bend. Uh, but ultimately, you know, whether it's scholarship, whether it's whatever. Honestly, as I said, this is very fruitless because. Arguing about Theodoret and Ibas, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think it's just a t- waste of time because, again, an Orthodox can just point off Eftichis and it's pretty much the same scenario. It's pretty much the same things happening, same things going down. So why should we uh, look the other way in one case and then suddenly go very critical on the other case? It doesn't make any much sense. Both EOs and OOs, by that logic, quote-unquote, exonerated heretics. So this is so now we're getting to the more juicy parts. It's gonna be the, it's the Tome of Leo, boys. The Tome of Leo. Finally, finally we're getting stuff to that actually matters. Saren Zillet naturally rejects the Tome of Leo. He says that the Tome of Leo, because of the language of the forms, uh, one particular form being ascribed to uh, God, the other particular form being ascribed to the humanity, he says that this is Nestorian. And he also uses the argument that Nestorius accepts the Tome of Leo. Bro, Nestorius accepts the Tome of Leo. Well, I guess um, Christianity is refuted because, well, Roman Catholics accept the Bible. Uh, Protestants accept the Bible. And they think that it says the true thing. So I guess... I guess Christianity is wrong then. I mean, this is this is kind of a silly argument. And a lot of, there's a lot of different arguments. One of the other arguments that Seren Zealot uses that sounds really cool, but when you look into it, it doesn't make any sense, is that he's when he's defending Severin, uh, or Severus of Antioch, he says, Severus of Antioch cites uh, out of all the people in church history, he cites St. Kirill the most. That means Severus of Antioch is the closest church father to Saint Kirill. Again, uh, you can literally copy and paste everything Saint Kirill says, 95% of the things he says, but that doesn't stop you from the other 5% being potentially wrong. It doesn't really matter. So you can cite him as much as you want. What matters is what you're saying. It doesn't matter if you cite his words. What matters is if you use his ideas. That's what matters. I can use a completely different language, but as long as I use the same idea that St. Kirill uses, I'm closer to St. Kirill than you are. That's the argument. And another thing with, with Nestorius accepting the Tome of Leo, uh, I'm going to cite St. Kirill. Uh, I believe I believe this. he cited this when he responded to Theodoret, I believe. He says, when, when he was accused of Apollinarianism, he says, not everything a heretic says nor accepts is heretical. Again, this is from St. Kirill. So, not the Tome of Leo is not heretical just because Nestorius accepts it. I mean, it's common sense. But there's, it's, it's worthy to look into the Tome of Leo in a, in a closer detail because there's a lot of different views on the Tome of Leo, right? On the one hand, we have the OO view that the Tome of Leo is Nestorian. Well, actually, we have a single view, and that's the Western view. The Tome of Leo is Nestorian, and also it proves papal supremacy, right? And it proves 
that Chalcedon, that the Chalcedon of Chalcedon was the victory of Western Christology, of uh, Western fathers. And it, and it seems to me, Sweden and Enoch, they seem to be on that crowd as well. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they don't think so. Maybe they actually think the, what actually happened. But this needs to be debunked because this this is a cancerous view, both from the West and from the further east from the orientals because it's completely not true at all and it's and what really happened at Chalcedon is that first of all saint leo's tome was not accepted initially what happened is that his tome was cross-checked with the writings of saint kirill for five days and i believe around 40 bishops 39 bishops um yeah i think around 39 bishops didn't accept the tome and they said they straight up said this is an historian this sounds very historian to me i can't accept this and and they were syrian bishops and then they were illyrian bishops right and the illyrian bishops were under rome as well so first of all this refused papal supremacy because why didn't uh, saint leo just use his just why didn't he just declare his tome ex cathedra teaching right why did the council need to cross-reference his tome Makes no sense. But at the same time, this also refutes, there's a subtle refutation of Oriental heterodoxy here. This begs the question, ask yourself, why is St. Leo's tome cross-checked, cross-referenced with the writings of St. Kirill in the first, first place? Isn't Chalcedon, isn't the basis of orthodoxy in Chalcedon St. Leo? Nope. The foundation of orthodoxy in Chalcedon is St. Kirill. Saint Kirill is the uh, the measure of orthodoxy in Chalcedon. If he wasn't, again, why would Saint Leo's writings be compared to the writings of Saint Kirill? Because Saint Kirill's theology is the default in that council. So it refutes both Roman Catholics, but it also refutes the Oriental heterodox. <clears throat> So, Severin Zealots once again claims Chalcedon didn't do enough against the story team. So, let's check the Chalcedonian definition. Throughout this whole debate, he constantly says, I don't, I don't feel like Chalcedon is Kirillian enough. I don't feel like it does enough against Nestorianism. So, let's take a look at the Chalcedonian definition and try to count the amount of Kirillian terms Compared to the amount of Leonian terms as well. Uh, so let's change the scene here. <sighs> this would have been great if I wasn't so sick. <coughs> so this is the Chalcedonian definition here. And there's a lot of important things that I want to also focus on. So... Let me just read this. In agreement, therefore, with the Holy Fathers, we all unanimously, I can't say that word, unanimously teach that we should confess that our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same. This is a this is a purely Kirillian term. So we got one Kirillian term here. There. The same perfect in Godhead and the same perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man. The same of a rational soul and body. Again, this is a Kirillian term to explain Christ's humanity. Consubstantial with the Father and Godhead and the same consubstantial with us in manhood. That is, again, this is Kirill. This is like us in all things but sin. Begun from the Father before the ages as regard, regards his Godhead. And in these last days, the same one begun from the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, as regards his manhood. For our sake and for the sake of our salvation, one and the same Christ, again, one and the same. Very crucial in this because it completely refutes the historianism. Son, Lord, only begun, who is made known. This is actually from Kirill. This is who is made known in two natures. This is from St. Kirill and... Um, I believe it's from the second letter to Sukensis. I'll have to check it, or the first letter. But I'm going to go into detail on who, what, what, who is made known signifies because it's very, very crucial in understanding into nature's terminology. Without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. So I believe I remember which one, but um, actually let me check. 
let me let me do some cross checking myself. Um, okay, so without confusion, without change, and without alteration. And so Kirill is pretty much supplanting three out of four of the um, adverbs here. And pretty much you can say separation, division, you know, pretty much all of them is same with what St. Kirill is saying. The difference of natures being by no means removed because of the union, but the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one principle. This is from St. Leo. So out, out of everything that St. Leo said, and Harvey is supposedly the standard of orthodoxy, compared uh, as opposed to St. Kirill. Only one of his known sayings is in the Chalcedonian definition. And one hypostasis, not parted or divided into two prosopa, not parted and divided into pr two prosopa. So again, how is this not against Nestorianism? I can't understand how one can read the Chalcedonian definition and still say that this doesn't argue against Nestorianism. But one and the same sun. Again, one and the same sun. You can't have one and the same sun in any form of, in any version of Nestorianism. Only begotten, divine word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets of old, and Jesus Christ himself have taught us about him, and the creed of our fathers has handed down. Now, what I want to focus on is who is made known. The Greek word here used is norizumenon. I even talked about this uh, in, in the stream I did with Jay. So what norizumenon means is made known according to the intellect. Now what does that mean? Christ is made known according to the intellect in two natures. That is a far cry from the Antiochian in two natures formula. And even Severin Zealot himself would agree. Everyone that knows what the Antiochians teach and what Chalcedon teaches will know that there is a huge difference in the into natures formula. Chalcedon says that Christ is made known in two natures, is made known in two natures according to the intellect. Where does Saint Kirill says this? Uh, let me let me find. Let me change the scene. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you the screenshot. Let me find it. Not here, not here, not here. Okay. What's the screenshot drive? Should be this one. Yes. Found it. Oh. It's going to be kind of hard to read this, but... I believe this is the second letter to Sokensis or the first one, either one of them. Either that or the formula with uh, John of Antioch. It, I'm going off the top of my head. I might be completely wrong. I'm I'm cross. I'm checking out. Okay, so this is from the second letter to Sokensis. So you can check it out for yourself. What does he say in the second letter? As to the manner of the incarnation of the only begotten, then theoretically speaking but only insofar as it appears to the eyes of the soul, we will admit that there are two united natures, but only one Christ and Son and Lord, the Word of God made man and made flesh. So again, this is, this is from St. Kill. And again, you can, you, can, you can try to argue that, um, that he refuted the people who tried to hold on for the same argument at the same time. But the problem with that is, the problem with that is, with, with making that sort of an argumentation, is that when you look at the church timeline afterwards, you don't see that to be the case. When you look at the Fifth Council, you don't really see that to be the case. Again, you're going to have heretics, as, as Sweden and Enoch rightfully points out, you're going to have heretics um, completely misunderstanding or completely picking and choosing what a certain person says. That's going to happen. So using that as an argument, oh, there are, there are Nestorians that accepted this, or there are Nestorians that kind of got the different idea. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. What Chalcedon says, really says, is what matters. And so we can see here, uh, let me get back to this. So we have one, two, three. 
I'm counting these connected. Four, five, six, seven. So there are seven different Kirillian terms. Well, let's say six, okay, for the sake of argument. Probably even more. I might have missed certain uh, terms that are unique to Saint Kirill here. But Kirillian terminology, Kirillian Christology, Kirillian theology is all throughout the Chalcedonian definition. No one can try to argue that it isn't. So just because it doesn't use Miaphysis and only uses it a hundred years later, or just because it doesn't use out of two natures formula, is not a good enough argument because that formula is accepted in in a way of exception. Uh, let me in an apophatic way you could say, right? Because the into natures in Antiochian sense is rejected. But the out of two natures formula in a different language was accepted. And the Fifth Council expanded on that. If if that was contradictory, then the Fifth Council will not even have happened. There's no contradiction between the Fourth Council and the Fifth Council. So is that is that it? Let me see. Let me check my notes. All right, that seems to be. I don't move on right now. I might have forgotten something, um, but I don't think I have. One last thing I want to note, actually. Yeah, yeah. This is also kind of important. Um, let me, because there's another uh, writing from Saint Kirill that I want to show you. I don't usually like doing this. I don't like. Like, like, <laughs> I don't like reading stuff out because it to me it seems like quote mining. But this isn't really quote mining because I'm I'm explaining what he's thinking here as well. It's not as if I'm just like reading it out loud and I'm saying, oh yeah, figure it out for yourself. No, like I'm actually explaining to you what's going on here. So this is from. Let me make sure. I think this is from. This is from, uh, yeah, Formula for Union. This is from the Formula for Union with John of Antioch. Which, by the way, <clears throat> I forgot to mention, um, Dioscorus, as I said before, is Kyrillian. He, he does believe in the Kyrillian theology. So trying to argue that he's not Kyrillian is kind of shooting yourself in the foot. The problem with Dioscorus and the Oriental thought, including Severus, uh, Philoxenus, so on and so forth, the problem with those people is that they do not accept the concessions of St. Kirill. So notice, you will use these arguments from his letter to Socensus, to his letter to uh, John of Antioch, but they'll, they'll try to divert the attention, right? They'll, they'll, make, they'll argue as if he never made an argument. Dioscorus, for Dioscorus, uh, his reconciliation with the Antiochian church was due to imperial pressure. He doesn't actually think that... He thinks that St. Kirill was pressured... And that uh, St. Kirill made a mistake in conceding. But St. Kirill, for St. Kirill, he pointed out to Dioscorus and the people uh, that didn't believe in concessions. He said that, look, they're basically saying the same thing. I'm not conceding. They're, they're actually saying the same thing as we are doing, but in a different language. And he even points out, like, some of you try to say the same things that I do, but you don't actually believe in it. So in the stories, for example... Um, will do the same thing. So let's take a look at this from the Formula of Union. As for the evangelical and apostolic sayings about the Lord, we are aware that the theologians take some as common as referring to one prosopon, but distinguish others as referring to two natures, that they interpret to God befitting ones in accordance with the Godhead of the Christ and the humble ones in accordance with the manhood. So notice, God befitting ones in accordance with the Godhead of Christ and the humble ones in accordance with the manhood. Now, where have I seen this before? Um, could it be the supposed Nestorian Tome of Leo? If you're trying to say that the Tome of Leo is Nestorian because it speaks of different forms, right? The, the divine form shining in miracles and the fleshly form uh, suffering uh, from hunger and so on and so forth. If you say that's Nestorian, then you have to say that St. Kirill is also Nestorian. Because St. Kirill 
actually like saint leo says the same thing as saint kirill says in his formula for Universe. so saint leo is not making stuff up on his own he is actually coming up with these things from saint kirill and again god befitting once in accordance with the godhead of christ and the humble ones in accordance with the manhood on reading these holy words of yours and thereby finding that we too think in this way for there is one lord one faith one baptism we gave glory to God to save our fall. We rejoice, we, rejo we, rejo blah, blah, blah. we rejoice with one another because the church is with us and knows which you hold the faith that concurs with God inspired scriptures and the tradition of our holy fathers. So again, uh, let me let me find the relevant passage. All right, seem to have found it. Uh, let me read. Okay, so the main the main problem that OOs have with the tome of Leo, and let me actually just move to the. All right. The main problem they have with Tome of Leo is this particular phrase. Each form affects what is proper to it in common with the other. That is, the word operated what belongs to the word, and the flesh operated what belongs to the flesh. One of these shines forth in miracles, the other succumbs to injuries. So compare that with this. They interpret the God befitting ones in accordance with the Godhead of the Christ, and the humble ones in accordance with the manhood. There's no substantial difference here. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> rejecting this, rejecting the Tom of Leo, leads to monotelitism and monoenergism. Because what Pope St. Leo is really doing there is that he's describing the operations proper to those natures. Now, energy is a property of nature, right? So if Christ has two natures, then Christ has two energies. Christ has two natures. Christ has two wills. And rejecting this on the basis of that means that you believe that Christ does not have two energies, Christ does not have two wills, but in fact, he has a single will. You can say it's a theandric will. Number one, that will make no sense because the theandric will presupposes duality, which, which Severus rejects. We reject all forms of duality in terms of wills. Um, actually, let me even get that as a screenshot so people don't think we make stuff up here. Uh, let's go. All right. There we go. So, he says, We have understood and understand the statement of the all holy Dionysius the Areopagite, who says, When God became human he performed for us a new divine human activity the tian he's talking about the tiandric will as one composite activity in our eyes it cannot be understood other than as a rejection of every duality so he's emphasizing on the tiandric energy whereas saint john of damascus when you're speaking of uh, wills and energies he's speaking that there is that's out of uh there's one theandric energy out of two, right? So he says, when we speak of one theandric operation, this is St. John of Damascus, when we speak of one theandric operation of Christ, we understand the two operations of his two natures, the divine operation of the divinity and the human op operation of the humanity. So first of all, I'm not making this stuff up. This is literally St. John of Damascus. I'm repeating what he is saying. And this, this, this marks off a significant difference that we have with the OOs. Their understanding of nature's, their rejection of St. Leo's tome leads to monotelitism, leads to monoenergism. That's where the problem is with, with the OOs. So, we could, hopefully, we wish we could have gotten more theology, but what happens is that... Uh, well, it seems to me that the moment stuff started to get into the vein of theology, the fake Orthodox changed the discussion to their typical talking points about ecumenism in the O. So they, they're pretty much trying to argue. It's so weird, right? That the, the, the whole topic is about Chalcedon. And here they are. They're trying to like um, argue against the problems that the OO church is suffering today. Um uh, but the weird thing here is, right, they, they, they point out, as I, I think I mentioned this before, but they pointed out how um, 
certain OO churches were ecumenical. Armenian churches used the uh, lev uh, unleavened bread, whereas the Coptic Church uses leavened bread. And these the these crucial theological differences and how do you still maintain communion? And ultimately, they ask like, how can you stay a comedian because of, you know, uh, you have people in your church that communes with EOs. And Severin Zealot says, yes, we unfortunately do, sir. And then they argue, well, you can't do that because this is a stupid argument. I already refuted this argument, by the way. I don't have any problem refuting it. But the, the argument is... Essentially, you you have an obligation. You should hundred percent all the time uh, get excommunicate heretics that preach heresy bareheaded. Um, the topic is Chalcedon, and yet you don't know anything about it because right after the Council of Ephesus, right after the formal of reunion, numerous people in the Antiochian Church, numerous bishops, will want Nestorius back into the church. They will literally say Nestorius did nothing wrong. They will preach Nestorianism. That's why St. Kirill of Alexandria still argued against Nestorianism. Because there were people still preaching Nestorian doctrines. So Nestorianism was still in pr it was still a problem in the Antiochian church. You still had people preaching heresy bareheaded. And, uh, and the examples they used <clears throat> about how the monks instantly broke off communion uh, with Nestorius. Okay, that's fine. Th there's nothing wrong with breaking communion. With those that are preaching public heresy. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no problem with that. But neither is there a, a complete problem with maintaining communion. So an example I used in my refutation of the fake orthodox is St. Gregory the Elder. St. Gregory the Elder signed an uh, Arianizing creed. For three years, he publicly, I mean, he professed a Arian doctrine. He professed an Arian creed. Um, pope Saint, I think Linus, I might be wrong here, but there was another Pope at the time that also signed Arianizing creeds. Um, did the entire church break communion with them? Upon realizing this, actually, Saint Gregory, uh, Saint Gregory the Elder was the father of Saint Gregory. Nazi. I, I don't want to. I don't want to make stuff up. Saint Gregory the Elder. Just to make sure that we're saying yes. So Saint Gregory Nazianzus says father <coughs> preached open bare bareheaded heresy for three years. What did Saint Gregory Nazianzus do? Did he break communion like these like these fakes say? No, they did not. They what what did they what did he do? He actually rebuked the monks that broke communion with his father, and he said, "You're being too hasty." And then three years later, his father repented. So this is pure proof that it's not the way that these guys are ascribing. So they kind of try to dogpile Seren Zealot because they can't respond to his arguments. And they're changing the topic into the problems in the OO church, which is completely unnecessary. That's not how debate is done. That's not how you do a debate on a topic. It's not even relevant to the Council of Calcutta. They try to make it relevant to the Council of Calcutta, but it's a cop. They even said that one of the arguments is, you know, if you if you're ecumenical towards the Eastern Orthodox, then you know what's stopping you from being ecumenical with Jehovah's Witnesses? Come on, I mean, you know, there's a there's a huge difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Oriental Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox. I mean, I'm not I'm not excusing ecumenism. Well, I'm fine with ecumenists in heretical churches. <laughs> They're nicer to us, so like, why will I hate them? But there's a huge, I mean, in that logic, there's a huge difference between Jehovah's Witnesses and Oriental Orthodox. There's a huge difference between Roman Catholics and Oriental Orthodox. There's a huge difference between Assyrian Church of the East and Protestants. I mean, you can't, you can't put, place them on the same grade. And Samuel Zilla did give a good answer. Even though he didn't really understand ecclesiology much, I, th I feel like he doesn't really know much about ecclesiology. I think he gave the correct answer. He said, ultimately, we understand this as a mystery. I mean, we can't really rationalize it too much. And I think, yes, you know, we can ration rationalize it to a certain degree. But at the same time, you know, there is a mystical aspect of it. And you can't really be dogmatic about these things. Because, again, as history shows, it's not as these rigorists say. Should we ideally break communion with heretics, with ecumenists? Yes. 
hundred percent we should be breaking communion with heretics and ecumenists. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Does that mean that the church enters into heresy? Does that mean, let's say, Church X is preaching heresy bareheaded and Church Y is in communion with that church? Is everyone in communion with Y poisoned? No, this is idiotic and history proves that to be wrong. So ultimately, uh, you know, it's just a stupid, stupid, stupid argument. Uh, also, one other thing that he also points out, yeah, after the formal of reunion, he points out the people venerated Theodoret of Mopsus and Theodore of Tarsus. And what do they say? By the way, when you when you use a historical example that disproves these people, they always cope. Have you noticed that? Has anyone ever noticed that? I noticed that in, in their reply when I when they faced the um the argument from Saint Gregory the Elder in the stream, they completely coped. They said, uh, I don't think that happened. I, I doubt that happened. Really? Really? You're gonna be like uh, everything that affirms my view happened. Everything that doesn't affirm my view never happened. That's the kind of the view that these people have. So you can never prove these heretics wrong. That's why it's a waste of time dialoguing with them. It's better to just point out where they're wrong. So you, the listener, don't end up being uh, subverted by these by these heretics. The fact that I, by the way, another interesting thing, I think I even mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again if I have. Um, it's very interesting how they uh, cry when other people are not being ecumenical with them. Like, for example, they cry that I call them fake orthodox, but they, 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 then they call me ecumenist. Well, you know what will be ecumenist? Saying that they're legitimate? That will be pretty ecumenist. And they want me to do that? They want me to call them true orthodox? No, I'm going to call you fake orthodox because to me, you're fakes. You're not in the Ark of Salvation. I mean, it's so hypocritical. Of course, you're going to expect me to be anti-ecumenical towards you because you're not in my church. But then, because I'm not ecumenical towards you, I'm an ecumenist. What? Zero brain in these people. That's why they have 500 subscribers and they're on YouTube for years. Whereas, I'm doing this for months and I have 300 more subscribers than they have and probably will have more. This is why. <laughs> this, is, this is the reason why. Because they're hypocrites. Sorry for the humble brag. I should probably not have done that. But whatever. Let's let's move on to the debate review. <clears throat> so he points out that he had, that Nestorians were uh, venerated. Nestorians were venerated. Even Nestorius himself was in a way venerated. And Enoch says, no, no, no. They thought their writings were forgeries. That's why they venerated. Uh, no, they weren't. There's no evidence. You just made that up. You're just coping. You're You're completely coping. Their two sons' doctrines were openly defended, and many people in Antioch wanted Nestorius to be exonerated. That's not thinking that they, they were forgeries. They read what they wrote, they read what they wrote, and they said, "This is right. This is what's orthodox." <clears throat> this wasn't even the first time. Eusebius of Nicomedia wants to overturn the Council of Nicaea, and he baptized Saint Constantine when there were people that actually knew about this. When he led a faction that wants to overturn the council of Nicaea why do you think he wants to get rid of Saint Athanasius give me a break keep on coping <clears throat> so back to Chalcedon back to the debate of Chalcedon um, Severin Zealot said that he will be convinced if he saw Chalcedonians affirming Theopaschism now to their credit <coughs> They pull, uh, the, the fake Orthodox pull out Fulgentius of Ruspe. To their credit, that's a very good response because Fulgentius of Ruspe openly teaches Theopaschism. They straight up quote him. That's a, that's a good usage of quote mining. That's, that's like the only acceptable use of quote, uh, quote mining. And Severin Zealot himself said, yes, that's, that he's teaching Theopaschism. Um, but then, you know, he kind of said that, um, <clears throat> You know, if I saw one person, I will accept Chalcedon. But then he later on said, um, I need more. Basically, this needs to be made sure. I mean, I can't fault him for that. Um, I know I know his intentions. He's really just trying to, you know, understand if Theopaschism was in the mainstream. But there is an argument to be made about this. And there's an argument to be made about this from St. Leo. 
So let's look at Leo's tome because I actually pointed that out to Severin Zealots about that. I said he he claimed that uh, Leo's tome didn't even teach Theopascus. He said Saint Leo does it. No one in Calcutta teaches Theopascus. And I said no, Saint Leo actually does teach Theopascus. He does teach Theopascus. And a couple of weeks later, I was vindicated when um, a certain guy named Peter, who's the writer of the uh, the famous. Um, article on Orthodox Christianity about old calendars ecclesiology, which I do cite in my video against fake Orthodox, and I will recommend you go check that out. He posted this, which is very crucial. In the in the Tome of Leo, Pope Saint Leo says the divine Son of God, the impassible God, did not despise to become a suffering man, and deathless as he is, became subject to the laws of death. So how is this not Theopascism? If if you if you try to argue that this is not Theopascism, I'm I'm really sorry, but I think you're coping. If you if you really think this is not Theopascism, and even in other places in, in the Tom, he is very very close to teaching what the twelfth anatema is teaching. So again, this argument that we don't have a Theopascal understanding. I mean, Kalkana teaches Theopascism. So this argument to me doesn't make any sense. Just because even Theodoret, which again, he doesn't teach Theopascus, but even Theodoret comes very close. And he's like the worst person. He's the worst person to like argue on this topic. And even he comes really close to Theopascus. So again, it's a, it's, a, it's a pointless argument. I don't really see the force of this argument that we don't teach Theopascus. Now... Severin Zealot mentions in uh, as a response to Sweden that uh, he's correct to state that the natures don't suffer, persons do, right? So there is no human nature that suffers. This is kind of a tricky thing that people fall into a lot. Um, natures don't die, persons do, right? The person is what does, but the nature grants you, in a way, let's say, the abilities to be able to do those things. But if you try to anthropo, if you try to make uh, natures into persons, well, you're kind of doing, you're kind of committing the folly of Nestorius. And um, yeah, I see this, I see this a lot. So it's it's important to correct. Um, saying that Christ died because of his humanity, that's not wrong, right? Christ died. Well, how could God die? Well, because God was man. Right, so he died in his humanity. That's correct. That's that's a correct thing to say. Uh, that's not that's not wrong to say. God, uh, Christ's humanity died. Now, with qualifications, that could be correct. But now suddenly it's starting to seem worrying. Right, you could have a correct interpretation, but at the same time you can have a very wrong interpretation. What if Nestorius heard that and say, "Yes, sir, you're correct. Christ's human prosopon died," and you're like, um. That's not what I was trying to say, <laughs> right? So it's important to understand uh, what we're reading meaning. It's it's these precise uh, languages are very important. Uh, let's see. Oh, so we're approaching. We're pretty much approaching the end of this debate review. It's been pretty long. I think it's been like a little bit less than two hours, which is pretty good because the debate is two hours. So that's a that's a success. Um, let me see. Okay, and we're we're also going to be uh, put placing fifteen minutes, I believe, uh, separating some fifteen minutes and looking into Severin beliefs because Severus of Antioch was not really mentioned in this debate, and that's very disappointing. I was really looking forward to when I was listening. To, I was really looking forward to hearing what the uh, fake Orthodox would say against Severin theology. Because they they will fall into a lot of the traps that uh, Seren Zelt was going to place in. But actually, we didn't get to hear them. The debate was all about Kalkadon and it was subverted into a fake orthodox discussion that these people probably do it every single episode. So, the discussion went on to the 12 anatomas. So, Seren Zelt's problem was that the 12 anatomas were not accepted, were not read in the Council of Kalkadon. Now, this argument doesn't really make sense. Sweden very rightfully points out. And again, these 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 are very good uh, rebuttals by Sweden. 
uh, credit is where is credit due, right? Terrible people, heretics, but not everything a heretic says is wrong. <laughs> so, Sweden points out that they were already accepted at Ephesus, that the 12 chapters were accepted at Ephesus, and Ephesus was accepted at Chalcedon. So, are you going to repeat everything that the previous council said? That's a very legitimate argument, actually, yes. So, Chalcedon does accept the 12 chapters. Um, it wasn't read then, but in virtue of accepting Ephesus, it accepts the 12, council, uh, the 12 chapters. Another thing I, want, uh, I wanted to mention that I forgot, and I think this is very important, is the context of Chalcedon. So, you see, there's this kind of a view where in, in the Council of Chalcedon, people think that, oh, they, the bishops had all the time in the world, there was no pressure, um, everything was deliberate, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's not really true. Chalcedon faced imperial pressure. The council faced imperial pressure. So to say that the council, like uh, to assume that every every bishop in the council um, had free reign, so on and so forth, it's kind of dishonest. So the important thing to understand is that right before, uh, right when the council even started, the emperor wanted a declaration of it. He wanted the symbol of fate. So there was already imperial pressure for that. And uh, as time went on, the emperor said, hey, you know, when are you guys going to make your declaration? Come on, I'm, I'm waiting for you to do something. And the reason, I will say, the major reason why the out of two natures formula was not even used in Chalcedon is because uh, this, I believe, the Syrian bishops, I want to make sure, but I think I read that the Syrian bishops vetoed it which is incredibly ironic if you're trying to say that, oh, the story of influence. Remember, it was also the Syrian bishops that said that the tomb of Leo was an historian. Uh, so you can't have, you can't pick your poison, right? Are they an historian um, or are they actually Karelian, right? So they vetoed it. Uh, but what the, what the, the argument that I'm trying to make here is, had it not been for the imperial pressure, will the rest of the bishops, who were majority Kyrillian, will have been able to convince the Syrian bishops and say, hey, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with this formula. We can talk about this and and manage to convince you and, and see what actually St. Kyrill says. If that happened, I'm fairly convinced that their minds will be changed. And what's my proof? Nikaya was exactly that. Entering into the council where it was full of Arians, out of the council, everyone was Orthodox. So, I was pretty. Mu I'm pretty much convinced that had it not been for imperial pressure, it would have been uh, possible for a clearer definition that will look something closer to the Fifth Council. But that's not really the biggest issue in the world because, as I mentioned again, if you look at the Chalcedonian definition, it came out with a definition that pretty much uh, used Kyrillian ideas and theology and philosophy and Christology with East, with Antiochian language in a way. And even then, as I said, into natures, the into natures used in the Chalcedon is not the same into natures used by the likes of Nestorius, Theodorus of Mopsuestia, and so on and so forth, because they will never, I don't think that any part, person in the Nestorian party will ever accept the into natures formula only made known according to the intellect. I don't think any of them will accept that. I, I will. I, I think they will say no. They are. It's into nature's in reality. Nope. Chalcedon says it's only. It's only according to the eyes of the soul, buddy. Saint Kirill says so. And so, trying to argue that Chalcedon <coughs> is divorced from Saint Kirill, and this goes to both west and the, and the further east. It makes no sense. It's a stupid argument. It's it's an ignorant argument. I think I think Eric Yubara even tries to make this argument. It's it's nonsense, right? The only reason the West tries to focus on the tome of Leo, do you think they care about what Pope Saint Leo says in his tome? If Pope Saint Leo said all sorts of stupid stuff in his tome, they will still try to make it as if it was the standard of orthodoxy. Why? Because of papal presuppositions. But what happened in reality is not papal supremacy what happened in reality is guess what what happened in reality is Kyrillianism in the council of Chalcedon so ultimately it's a Kyrillian victory and unfortunately this case have happened because a lot of people don't like the concessions 
that is, that Saint Kirill gave. And they don't accept any sort of concessions, quote unquote concessions. They, they aren't even real concessions. So the the latter part of the debate, which I honestly didn't even care about, was about scholar dispute. Who said why? Um, this scholar, that scholar, who cares, right? And and they spent so much time during the debate, like they asked for source, like oh, you know, where did you get that? And like oh, let me just let me just Google it again. Let me check my sources again. And it just destroyed the flow of the debate, right? I, I, that's why I think th these kinds of debates, they're 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 not really doing their purpose. So again, as I've mentioned at the beginning. Uh, my verdict, my personal verdict, is that in terms of theology, I think Severin Zealous, Zealot could have done way better. He he won in that department because there were a lot of moments where he catched them off guard. And uh, could have completely turned the debate around and dominated it. But he didn't. So that's that's not really his... That's not him being stupid. That's just him... Uh, not being able to say th right things at the right time during debates, and that that's really what's dependent. I mean, as you can see here, I'm uh, I'm forced to talk for long, uh, long, long, mi long minutes for a long time, and I'm pretty much stammering, right? So this is not really an easy thing to do. It's kind of hard to collect your thoughts uh, during the debate. So I don't fault him for that. In terms of like, like how to debate. Sweden and his crew did better, uh, but as I said, you kind of had to understand this was a two versus one. This is this is not a one v one. This is two versus one. So this is not a fair, fair fight. So Severin Zillet did a good job at holding uh, his ground. Um, he did have to repeat himself in a lot of cases, even though he kind of got refuted. Which um, I think, looking back, he's going to have to think about. That. I think he's going to have to think about that. Like, was I right in that? Did like, was my point correct, or maybe I'm not getting something that's out there? Uh, so I think that there's something that he needs to think about uh, in terms of you know history, in terms of asking the correct questions and giving the correct rebuttals. There are a lot of moments where Sweden and Enoch made correct rebuttals, but again, you have to understand this is a two versus one, but. There were a lot of good questions that they asked, good rebuttals they gave to Severin Zealot's argumentation. So Severin Zealot's argumentation in Kalkadon, it's kind of weak because the whole force of the argument is that uh, for hundreds, for a hundred years, you guys were maybe wrong. That's his argument. And when you look like when you just hear it like that, it's kind of like, wow, like who cares? <laughs> Who cares? You see, he himself admit that after a hundred years we got it right, but at Kalkadon, we might have not gotten it right. And so in this stream, hopefully, I showed you um, in this review that we did get it right. We did get what Saint Kill was trying to say, and hopefully, made a good defense of the Council of Kalkadon. Now, I want to get to something that I think actually matters. And that is Severus of Antioch. And there's certain doctrines of Severus of Antioch that I'm going to talk to you guys about so you guys know, so you can be educated about him. And I'm going to 100% reference uh, Joseph Farrell and his great work, God, History, and Dialectic. I think that's a must read for everyone. There's a lot of really good information about orthodoxy. It's a shame that Farrell apostatized. It's a, it's a big shame, but in terms of patristic scholarship, he is number one. I've heard some priests even say he's number one across all time. Like he's the best patristic scholar this world has ever seen. Period. So there's a certain there's certain issues with Severan theology, Severan metaphysics that I think is not orthodox and is completely wrong, and you don't see it in the church. One of them is. The self-subsistent, non-self-subsistent hypostasis argumentation. Now, um, Severin Zealot thinks, Severin Zealot believes that uh, St. Kirill believes in the self-subsistent, non-self-subsistent subsistent hypostasis distinction and that whole metaphysic that uh, Severus has. What self-subsistent means is things that can exist on their own so, for example, a soul can exist on its own, uh, but a body cannot exist on its own. Uh, so it's non-self-subsistent. 
And so Christ is a composite self-subsistent hypostasis um, out of humanity and divinity. Now, I'm not going to get too much into detail, but this is something that's first, we did, we're seeing this for, for the first time in Severus. We're not seeing this from St. Kirill. And um, Sever, uh, Severin Zealot tries to argue that the body and soul analogy is exactly this. Now, I can see the parallels. I can see the argument. But it is still a far cry from what St. Kirill is saying and what Severus is saying. It's still a far cry from these two thinkers. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a very... Uh, good reason. But however, one thing what's what's really interesting, and one of the reasons why there's a monophysite charge, it, there's two reasons, and one of them is I'm going to outline now is that um, he believes that uh, the self-subsistent hypostasis is the self-subsistent hypostasis is a precisely a concrete individual reality, and that it may be an, it may be iconically portrayed. So, give me a second. So, from Severus, hypostasis does not deny genus or usi or abolish it, but it sets apart and limits, in particular, icons, the one who subsists. Right? And for Severus, there is a plat platonic understanding of reality. It's kind of like a platonic Christian understanding of reality. That I pointed out in uh, with Jay, I pointed out this, this to Severus, and he said, um, he said, I, I don't, I think he said that I don't know about this or something of this. I don't really remember, but for Severus, uh, reality exists on three broad, broad planes. There is the Trinitarian plane. There is the angelic plane, the intelligibles, and there is a sensible world. The sensible world is this material world that we live in the angelic realm that there is. And then there's a Trinitarian realm where the Trinity is. Right, so there's three separate planes of reality. Now, why am I even mentioning this? Well, because when we're looking, when we're starting to understand why Severus has the theology on uh, on will, operation, energy, this is why. Because when you when we're talking about the wills of Christ, well, Severus doesn't have a problem with saying that there's a human will and a divine will. So you might say, oh, that's that's Diotelite though. But actually, but when you when you look into what he thinks, for Severus, right, the will is one out of two, just like the hypostasis is one out of two, right. And again, we need to understand that for him, hypostasis equals nature. <clears throat> so you, you are your uh, nature, as Jonathan Hill, the heretic, was saying a couple of months ago. I don't know what he's saying now, but he used to. He called me a monophysite because I didn't believe that hypostasis equaled nature. Which is very weird because that is the monophysite position. But <clears throat> whatever. Uh, for Severus, because the uh, the self subsistence is re is represented iconically, the human will the human will is an iconic representation of the divine will. Why is that the case? Again, because the divine will is Trinitarian. It's in the Trinitarian realm of reality. They're not in the same realm of reality as the human will. Uh, so because of that, because they're not in the same realm of reality, the human will is subjected to the divine will. And so that there is one will because of that. The human will is completely subjugated. It's completely ordered beneath the divine will. Whereas people say, yes, the human will is in a way subjugated and ordered beneath the divine will, but it's out of its own free will. Whereas in this case, the human human free will is completely irrelevant in this equation. And it's completely dictated by the divine will. Because again, the divine will is in the plane of Trinity. Another interesting thing about oriental uh, theology will be Philoxenus of Mabug. And he has this weird kind of understanding of nature and miracles. So for him, Christ's divinity, Christ is divine by nature. Okay, seems good so far. But then he says that he is a man by miracle. So he's referring to the virgin birth. Now, this affects his... Um, 
Eucharistic theology as well. This is where he gets his Eucharistic theology from. So the way he understands the Eucharistic theology is that the that uh, that the bread and wine is by nature bread and wine, and they remain by nature bread bread and wine, which is a far cry from transubstantiation, by the way. But by a miracle. They are to the eyes of the faithful, the body and blood of Christ. And so this com this kind of makes sense in the Eucharistic theology. I mean, if you don't have faith and if you approach the, the Eucharist and you're not baptized or anything, you're just secretly, you're pretending to be taking the Eucharist and, you know, Philoxenus of Mount, and then you come to Philoxenus and they say, ah, I took your Eucharist, what are you going to do about it, bro? And Philoxenus will say, uh, oh, you just had bread and wine. You mean, like, because that's not that's not the blood and but that's not the body and blood. You don't have faith. It will be the body and blood if you had faith, but you don't have faith. But this this superficially, this language kind of resembles Saint Kirill of Alexander. But the implication is very severe because. If you're saying that the humanity of Christ is a miracle, uh, one can see a human hypostasis and a divine hypostasis depending on whether one looks at him with faith or not. So if you have faith, you're saying, oh, you know, I see a human being here. But if you don't have faith uh, on the eyes of the non-faithful, he is divine. So this 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 Christology of Philoxenus of Malbuk is actually textbook monophysitism uh and this is kind of not really emphasizing this discuss this these discussions because people don't, don't really know uh, oh i forgot to mute my phone well i hope you enjoyed um black man laughing what i was saying here is that uh this sort of christological understanding of felix and this Mabug is completely heterodox right and in terms of uh, monotheism uh, I believe Patriarch Theodorus was an open supporter of uh, monotheism, and John of Ephesus himself points out that he, alongside Severus of Antioch, were the fathers of monotheism. Now, John of Ephesus is part of the Oriental Communion, so their own sources. So this is not Chalcedonian propaganda. This is Oriental Orthodox propaganda, I suppose. So. <laughs> And and also, if you look at the um, the writings of Severus of Antioch and whatnot, he's dealing with people that thought that the nature is mixed. He's dealing with the Eftichian position. So by his time, there wasn't any uniform um, anti Eftichian position. He kind of defined it. So we will give the, we will grant them that they're not Eftichian and that they're not monophysites in that sense. We, I'm fine with granting that, but. Um, remember Severin Zealous' argument? For a hundred years, you might have not been wrong. You might have not been right. Uh, we can use the same argument for you. So, again, double standards. And the second reason, I pointed out the first reason, the second reason why we will uh, call them monophysites is because of their rejection of theophysis. But it's not the reason why. It's kind of a different reason. So, <clears throat> when we are and I mentioned this in Jedi's stream, there are two different formulas, and I've talked about this in this stream as well. There's two different formulas that are both correct. The Miaphysis formula, which emphasizes uh, Christ being out of two natures, right, that Christ is composed out of two natures, and then there's the in two natures formula, which emphasizes uh, the integrity of the natures in Christ. But, as St. Kirill points out, you, ha you only divide them by theory. Right? You only say that, there, that Christ is in two natures by theory, according to the intellect. Now, how we, what's the problem with rejecting this? Right? Is it this just in the mind? So, like, it doesn't happen in reality. So, who cares? Well, it actually doesn't matter because those two natures are natural. Sorry. Those two natures are natural properties. Saint Leo also used them as natural properties. And as I pointed out before, Saint Leo uses them as natural properties and rejecting those ideas leads to monotheism, monoenergism. So the point here is that energies and will, they're both products of nature. 
not hypostasis. If they're a product of hypostasis, then the Trinity has three different wills and three different energies. But the Trinity is one in essence, one in energy. Which we don't have any problem saying there's one energy in the Trinity. <coughs> no problem with that. But energy is a property of nature. So because of that, we know that Christ is Christ is consubstantial with the Father and consubstantial in humanity because of his energies. Right? The nature makes itself known through the energies. And so that's how we know that yes, Christ is Christ is human and divine. Uh, that's how we know it. <clears throat> but the problem here is rejecting into nature's formula, you reject the natural properties. You reject the natural properties. You suddenly reject the two different energies in Christ. You reject the two energies in Christ. You get a single energy. You get mana energism. You got mana entelitism. This is a logic that leads you to mana entelitism. And because you believe in mana energism, how how many natures does Christ have? How how do we know that? Only one. Why? Because nature makes itself known through its energies. And so if there's only one energy, there's only one nature. And it's no, 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 no. It's not one incarnate nature of God, the Word. That's, that's reality, that's individual reality. That's a different nature. We are talking about essence, usia. One usia, monophysitism. This is another, this is the second reason why your position ends up in monophysitism. I completely understand that um, you're not, you don't refer to, you don't consider yourself monophysites. I completely understand that. I completely understand that you accept out of two natures. Ek diophysion. I completely understand. I'm, I'm completely aware of all of that. My point is that it's inconsistent. It's not that you can say right things at certain times. My point is that this theology is inconsistent. And that is the problem. That is the problem at hand that we need to deal with. And this happens because of rejecting Chalcedon. You reject the Council of Chalcedon, you reject this. Now, does St. Kirill believe in diotelitism? Yes, as I point out in the stream with Jay Dyer. And when it came to um, interpreting Mark 13.32, when it came to interpreting Mark 13.22, which is about, uh, the, uh, about Christ not knowing the hour of the second coming, St. Kirill points out, that he is, when he's answering that question, he is making use of his human will. He is giving a human-centered answer. That's textbook diotelitism in Saint Kirill. So there's, there's that's one of the main divergences here for for Nestorius. That proved to Prosopa because oh look the human Prosopa. He has no idea about the second coming, but we know that the word of God obviously knows the, the time of the second coming. Whereas St. Kill says, no, 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 no. We're dealing with one single person. Nestorius responds, how is this possible? One person that you're saying that God does not know the, the hour of the second coming? Are you kidding me? And St. Kill points out, no. Nestorius says, how is this possible? Because Christ as a single person, has two wills. Because he has two wills, he can give a human-centered answer where he legit legitimately does not know. Not legitimately, but he, ha he doesn't have absolute... He has um, not absolute limitation. I forgot the term. Let's say limitations. So he has limitations in that way, but these are not absolute limitations. So Christ, he absolutely knows the hour of the second coming. But he gave a human-centric answer. So he made use of his human will. This, by the way, doesn't mean gnomic will. Um, because as St. Kirill says, he, this is not an absolute. If this was an absolute limitation, that, that the human will absolutely limited Christ, then yes, that will mean that there is a gnomic will in Christ. But because he says that this is not an absolute limitation, it's just a textbook diatelitism. So St. Kirill teaches diotelitism. Um, another place in the Thesaurus, St. Kirill teaches that uh, uh, nature and energy, nature and operation is not the same thing. So the essence and energies are not the same thing. So he believes in essence and energies distinction. And one interesting thing that I think I forgot to mention, and it's very vital about essence and energies distinction in a way, 
is uh, Nestorius' second reply to St. Kirill. Now, in, in the second letter to Nestorius, St. Kirill makes distinction these distinctions between nature you know he says okay the human nature the humanity of christ is not the same as the divinity of christ there's no mixing here uh, there there is a distinction and then nestorius he interprets that as division he even says you you rightfully say that the natures are divided you rightfully say that the humanity and divinity are divided but then you say these other things about the union that completely contradicts that. So Nestorius, he, he, he understands that distinction means division and composition. Whereas St. Kirill does not think that. And that is why Nestorius cannot understand the natural union and the distinction of natures. <coughs> I've personally seen... Now, I'm not going to make, like, this might be someone that's completely wrong, but I did see a, a forum post from an Oriental Orthodox um, who seemed to know what he's talking about, and he said that the essence and the energies are only distinct in theory. That's completely wrong. That's completely wrong. That's completely wrong. That's a Roman Catholic view. So I'm not going to base my view. Like, maybe, maybe he's the minority, and the mainstream opinion is that the essence and energies are really distinct. But I'm seeing certain people in, in the Oriental Communion that's making that's having the Roman Catholic view on the essence energies distinction. I, I don't fully know, but essence energies distinction is very vital in a way uh, to this to this topic. And as I mentioned before, um, Nestorius, another another a main reason why Nestorius cannot accept uh, Kyrillianism, Kyrillian Christology, is precisely because of that because. If you distinguish things, you necessarily have to divide them. And that will pretty much be it. So let's recap. Let's recap with what went down in this debate. Debate recap. Who won the debate? I did. But who won the debate between Severin Zealot versus the fake Orthodox? Two fake Orthodox fighting against each other. Trying to prove who is the realest fake. Severin Zillet did. Severin Zillet won the debate. I'm sorry, but he won the debate because the theology is what matters. Not what who said what with empty statements. Um, a lot of really good places where the fake Orthodox were Sweden and his and his BF Enoch uh, caught Severin Zillet. He, they certainly caught him on a lot of different occasions. But the problem is again, it's the theology, and the, and there are two instances in the debate where Severin Zealot pointed out, or at least baited them into admitting something uh, that completely destroys their view, in their view, right? Not the orthodox view, but their view. To me, shows that Severin Zealot had the upper hand in this debate. Now, in terms of why I should not accept Chalcedon, why should I accept Chalcedon? It didn't really change my mind, and I don't think it will have changed anyone's mind. If, if a person that came into the debate not knowing about the debate uh, listened to this, I don't think he, I think he will have just been more confused. I think he will have been like, he will say, oh, it seems like Chalcedon exonerated his sworn heretics, but at the same time, it doesn't really seem to me that it is heretical, and a hundred years later, they already condemned him, so... It just makes people ask more questions. And ultimately, uh, this stream pretty much answers, hopefully, a lot of those questions. And thank you all for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. I, hopefully, I'll see you guys in the next video. This one was very long. Uh, I plan to make this a live stream, but I had a lot of images to show. And I don't think I will have made it work. There were a couple moments where I had to take a pause to eat. Um... And this took a very long time. This took a very long time, very long, a lot of effort, a lot of cross-checking, a lot of preparation. But I think it turned out well. So hopefully you liked it. Hopefully you learned a lot of things. Hopefully you understand the controversy between the Oriental Orthodox and the Eastern Orthodox. Hopefully you understand the Council of Chalcedon a lot better. Very important so that we don't get caught up in the Roman Catholic lies about the Council of Chalcedon, the, the, 
pro papal lies, which is absolutely incorrect. Thank you all for watching. Uh, God bless you all. For all those in the old calendar and in the new calendar, have a blessed nativity fast. And God bless you all. Thank you for watching. See you guys in the next video.